If you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric, with no fear breaching the masquerade. In this special episode, I shall be discussing my thoughts and opinions on the very first Werewolf the Apocalypse video game, Heart of the Forest, a brand new visual novel developed by different tales. On the 24th of July 2020, almost three months ago at the time of recording, I was allowed to unveil my critique of the Heart of the Forest demo, the third World of Darkness visual novel, and the very first video game using material from Werewolf the Apocalypse, arguably the most popular tabletop role-playing game within this fictional universe, after Vampire the Masquerade of course. For those of you who didn't get around to hearing my critique of it, first of all, shame on you. Second of all, I would say it was mostly a highly positive review of the demo, with the only complaint I could find was the length of the demo itself, and even then, it was me just being excited to sink my teeth into more of this visual novel, and I'm even more excited than before to tell you how much I love this game. Regular listeners know that the content I create is more focused around the aforementioned Vampire the Masquerade, and it would be fair to assume that I am not too familiar with the other World of Darkness games. That statement is very true at the time of recording, which was something that I addressed during the demo review. My contemporaries who managed to grab this game via Steam or GOG, or got a review copy as I did, will no doubt do a fantastic job at telling you in great detail how the developers have, or have not, modernised the lore of Werewolf the Apocalypse. I sadly cannot do that. Despite me saying previously the demo encouraged me to go and purchase Wealth the Apocalypse material, I thought better of it, and decided it would be better to go into Heart of the Forest as blind as possible, so I can help those who are new to the world of darkness and Wealth the Apocalypse, such as myself, see if there is a good entry point into the world of darkness through this game, which I believe is ultimately far more helpful and useful, something that other world of darkness content creators may omit. And just so that we are all on the same page, werewolves as you may know are mythical creatures. They are mortal humans that are able to shapeshift into wolf beasts. In the earliest of mythos, wolf men were believed to be sorcerers using devilish magic to transform themselves into animals. This legend would evolve into the modern myth where it is more of a disease which is called lycanthropy that is spread via werewolf bites. Upon a full moon, the transformation occurs, and the only way to kill a werewolf is to use a silver bullet or blade. Now, Werewolf the Apocalypse disregards a lot of this nonsense. Werewolf the Apocalypse is a tabletop role-playing game first released in 1992 by White Wolf Publishing, a year after Vampire the Masquerade. The player becomes a Garou, commonly referred to as a werewolf, whose transmutations are not dictated by the phases of the moon. The game takes place in a fictional version of our Earth, a secret world where werewolves, vampires and other legendary creatures secretly live besides humans, a world that is a dark reflection of our own filled with corruption, a world of darkness, if you would. Werewolves hate vampires, for they are said to be filled with an undeemable taint called the worm, and therefore must be destroyed. That being said, there is no mentioning of vampires in Heart of the Forest, which I personally believe is a fantastic narrative decision. Werewolves in the World of the Darkness universe fight a two-front war, one against spiritual desolation of urban civilization, and one against supernatural forces of corruption that seek to bring about the apocalypse, both of which are central themes for this video game. Heart of the Forest has you play as Maya, a woman in her twenties from the United States of America, who is searching for clues about her family in the last primeval forest in Central Europe, the Biovizia Forest, also known as the Pushka or Pushka Biovizia, which is located in Poland, so forgive my offensive botching of pronunciations that are not familiar to me. What made it a little easier for me to say these words is how the game highlights key terms of a breakdown of the pronunciations, which I can't help but think was something that was added in by the developers once they saw how practically every non-Polish speaking person who reviewed the game cannot say any of the words properly. Regardless, it was nice for that to be included anyway, in addition to a short description of such places and werewolf specific terms. Maya is accompanied by her friend Anya, a fellow student who came to Poland to study medicine, who can either be friendly or cold with you, depending on how you respond to her with regards to your dreams. The dreams I speak of act as the reason Maya is searching for her family. These dreams have 
been pulling her towards the forest, which you will see plenty of times throughout the game. The first of which takes place in the game's prelude, which mechanically serves the tutorial and a very loose character creation. It is very clear from this section alone that the developers have gone the extra mile to present the game as close to an actual tabletop RPG version of the game as possible in an attempt to engage the player. The character sheet that you create for your version of Maya through your choices and responses to situations does a wonderful job making me feel that I am playing a solo tabletop role-playing game with a character of my origin and creation. You are told very little of Maya throughout the story, and the game allows you to fully invest in creating your own Maya in the process. The way the main resources that are presented on the top of the screen adds to this as well, the resources being rage, willpower, and health, which I will break down for you now. The higher your rage, the more ambitious and aggressive you become, which can be useful in conflicts and physical confrontation. However, this makes your perception quite one way in your responses, as you become unable to see the bigger picture as you dive headfirst into everything, with little regard to the consequences. On the flip side, having a lower rage makes your Maya more empathetic and cautious to her surroundings, but it can make her more fearful in heated moments. During one playthrough of mine, I constantly had a low rage so I could learn as much as the characters in the world around me, not wanting to anger or annoy anyone, wanting to attune myself to the earth and forest. Now compare that to a more recent playthrough where I made sure my rage was as high as all times just to see what would happen. This approach proved to be just as enjoyable as the first. That was until my careless actions angered my friends and caused some of the characters to disappear and die. So consider your choices carefully with your responses, for your choices do matter to an extent. Willpower is the resource you need for self-control, to prevent you from being carried away by your rage. It can also be used for other difficult scenarios like forcing yourself to touch a severed head in the previously mentioned prelude, or talk to someone you know has been annoyed or angered by your actions. Should your willpower drop to zero, you won't be able to deal with many problems and situations, which often meant in my karma, low rage playthrough, this was my main resource. Willpower is gained by learning of the world around you and achieving certain goals you have set for yourself, both of which happen quite frequently during the game, which had the negative effect of me not really caring about running out of willpower because I knew I would get it back within the next 10 minutes, if that. Health is fairly obvious to what that implies, or at least I hope that it is obvious to you. But what did surprise me is you do not just lose health through taking damage in fights, but you physically have to push yourself sometimes and you can lose health that way, like hiking through the forest and you are feeling tired or you are trying to prevent yourself from getting a heat stroke. It makes you think twice about a lot of things as you worry, can Maya cope with all this physical stress? All of these things, plus the responses you give in dialogue, affects Maya's personality, which can also influence how brave and slash or spiritual Maya is. It also determines the sort of werewolf she will become later in the game. Everything I have described to you thus far does feel that the choices I had selected had a meaningful impact on Maya's behaviours, rather than the story's progression at this point. Depending on the mood you put Anya in, she will either storm off to the B&B you are both staying at or will wait for your friend Bartek to arrive, assuming that you can be calm enough to wait for him to arrive who may or may not accompany you to your next locations, which is either the town of Belovizia or the Pushka Forest, which serves the game's first main choice the player can make, as you cannot visit both in one playthrough. In the town, you meet Kim and Lisa. Kim is a non-binary punk activist from Berlin, whilst Lisa is a local herbalist and an immigrant from Belarus. In the forest, you meet Daniel, a stuttering local tour guide who claims to know the forest and its legends better than anyone else, and Cornell, a German eco-activist who came to Poland to save the Pushka from deforestation, which takes up the other half of the story. Interestingly, the forest is considered a character, which makes sense knowing the importance of spirituality in the game, which for me resonated a lot stronger than what I was prepared for. I had mentioned in my review of the demo that as a spiritual person myself who practices many faiths and different ways of thinking, a lot of what was being described resonated with me deeply in ways I was not emotionally prepared for, almost moving me to tears, and I can confirm that I had the same reaction in the same places and other places in the game. I ended up caring much more for the forest than I did the actual people in the game, who by the end of the game just blended in in the same sort of character human mesh for me. On a narrative point of view, making an entire forest a character with a will, nature and personality of its own presents some interesting questions for the player to consider. 
Where should our meddling in nature stop? Aren't we morally bound to interfere if it is for a good cause? How far would you go for a good cause? These are all themes not explored in video games very often, especially as mature and as subtle as this, and it's especially when you are playing as a werewolf that is stereotypically bound to its will to tear and rip at anything in its path. But to return to focusing on the plot and not philosophy, whichever path you choose, forest or town, you decide to attend the protests the following day, where you meet Olga, a local activist and leader of a militant arm of the protesters. Unlike Cornell, who is very much a man of peace, Olga is not afraid to shy away from violence and destruction, and, depending on which one you choose to be friendly with, will determine much of the game's narrative and how the authorities and press will view you and your actions. Choices in this game are presented to be very important, allowing the player, or should I say reader if we want to be a little bit pedantic, the freedom to carve out Maya's destiny and how she influences those around her to deal with the deforestation to reach one of five possible endings. That said, those choices are very linear and lack real depth in my opinion. Regardless to who you befriend or annoy, you will always reach the same conclusions, be it with some minor changes in the text, up until you reach a specific ending which is where I feel most people's playthroughs will stand out the most. You are either an angry violent protester or you are a peaceful one, with the option to be somewhere in the middle, not pleasing anyone and not always making narrative sense. For example, I had chosen one playthrough to show controlled anger with protests, rallying up a crowd which resulted in me being maced and sprayed by the police during the day with Olga, but decided during the night to be more peaceful with Cornell, and Maya thought it was weird how her thought processes changed so suddenly. Now, I initially thought this was rather clever writing, until the following playthrough when I was peaceful throughout and still had the same internal dialogue. That being said, that is a very, very small pick at the writing. As a whole, the writing is beautifully written, which I find the most appealing feature of the game for me. The formatting has since improved from the demo, as there are various text styles to choose from, so that those who are visually impaired, dyslexic or god forbid both, should find a font face that is easy for them to read, as there is no voice acting in this game, which did not bother me, as it did with Vampire the Masquerade Coteries of New York, one of the previous World of Darkness visual novels I mentioned right at the beginning, for Heart of the Forest was not marketed with voice acting. I knew what to expect from the word go. I love the raw and primal art style found throughout the game, with exception of two creepy collage-esque faces found towards the end of the game that reminded me of a weird mishmash between the Monty Python cartoons and anything found within the Mighty Boosh, as I felt they did not add to the game at all. The art of Heart of the Forest as a whole is not as clean looking as other visual novels such as Vampire the Masquerade Coteries of New York. Heart of the Forest does have its own natural art style that I can get behind, however, one that cannot be found in any other visual novel that comes to mind, making it stand out from the competition by miles. The art is both clear and vague, allowing the reader slash player to make interpretations of what the environments look like and how the characters are interacting with each other when they are all present by name and not by model. However, it can be pretty confusing sometimes trying to remember what everyone looks like during some sections of the game when most of the characters are talking and only some of them are shown, especially when some are introduced much later on, depending on your playthrough. For example, Daniel only appears much later in the game if you do not meet him in the forest and his and many other sudden arrivals are not integrated very well. Most of them are not terribly important to the overall plot either, with most of the narrative hanging onto the drama between Olga and Cornell. That being said, this approach of introducing the cast feeds on the imagination that would come so naturally when I am reading a book or playing a tabletop RPG with friends. The small number of animations present were beautifully fluid and were not distracting whilst I was reading. It also does a perfect job telling players who are more accustomed to the modern, metropolitan style of Vampire the Masquerade that Werewolf the Apocalypse has a very different feel and look to Vampire, all without a single word being mentioned. Similarly, the sound design is just perfect for this sort of game. From the sound of the blowing winds, the bus rumbling along the road, or the swarm of flies that would occasionally attack my left headphone speaker, I really felt a part of the world the team had created, which has clearly received a lot of love and dedication with regards to crafting and research. I especially like a section towards the beginning of the game where there were some small dogs barking, each one in a different place in the stereo field which is where they appear in the left or right or somewhere in the middle of your speakers or headphones. 
The general mix of these barks, combined with their placements in the stereo field, made me think on more than one occasion that they were my dogs annoying the neighbours. It is a very natural sounding soundscape, and I really appreciate the time and commitment to immersing the player with sound the developers and sound designers have made. With a high rage, you will notice a constant rhythmic boom, like a heartbeat, which I found more annoying than anything else. I can say the same sort of positive things with regards to the music, composed by Robert Bushke, I hope I pronounced your name correctly there. The soundtrack could have easily been more a constant in your face sort of thing, but it is appropriately understated, with instruments coming and going with the flow of the narrative, working with it rather than against it, just like any good soundtrack should. My one complaint, however, is that some of the music cues do not always loop as smoothly as it should, either just starting again with a somewhat audible click, or just jumping to the next cue as you progress to the next scene, which can be a little bit jarring and it often pulls you out of the moment, as it were. The one time where everything becomes very intense, appropriately so you might say, is when Maya enters her Krynos form for the first time, which is the in-game term for what most would understand to be a traditional werewolf form. When you witness it, you have the delight of hearing the most bloody and visceral sound design I have heard in a visual novel for a good couple of years. This metamorphosis is filled with horrible blood-curdling screams, snapping of bones, tearing and popping of gristle and muscle, and, of course, the snarls and growls of the werewolf itself. I winced and retorted in my sofa, sitting through this intense scene, loving and hating it at the very same time. In short, it was horrifying. In fact, it was one of three fiends in the entire game that scared me, which some may find disappointing, given the world of darkness and the games under its dark macabre umbrella are horror games. That said, the other scary fiends I referred to were fiends that I did myself that I had to go looking for, that I shall not tell you about now for, you know, spoiler reasons. My biggest complaint, however, lies with the game's length and pacing, which I believe will disappoint a lot of people, especially if you are coming into this being a fan of Werewolf the Apocalypse. Whereas I am told it will take about five hours to complete a playthrough, which is remarkably short on its own, I managed to do my first playthrough, taking my time, not knowing what was going to happen, in three hours, which is probably down to me being a naturally quick reader. It is fortunate that I knew there was going to be multiple endings and wanted to see what would happen if I chose A instead of B, as I would have been far more annoyed than I currently am. Whilst the following point does not bother me too much, I know a fair amount of people will be a little bit annoyed by the little werewolfing you do in the game. But why doesn't this annoy me? Well, the reason being is that Heart of the Forest is clearly not that sort of game, and neither is Werewolf the Apocalypse as a whole. Now, it may seem very bold of me to make that sort of claim, having next to no understanding about Werewolf the Apocalypse and rather new to the world of darkness as a whole, but it is very clear to me that the writers and developers of different tales understand and appreciate the nuances of Werewolf the Apocalypse and the world of darkness. The games in that universe are ones of self-discovery, ones where your whole world is turned upside down as you come to term what it means to be a supernatural creature, be it werewolf, vampire, mage, or fairy. In short, they are games of hope and hopelessness, dream and desires, salvation and damnation. Werewolf is not about running around and slashing things up because you're a big bad wolf. Whilst that is indeed needed sometimes, community and politics runs deep within the world of darkness games, and Heart of the Forest isn't an exception to that, and I applaud the writers and developers for that focus. As a game intended to act as a good primer about what is Wealth the Apocalypse to lure people into the world of darkness, I would say that this game has done a splendid job at that, as that is exactly what it has done to me. With beautiful original artwork, masterful and yet easy to understand writing, accompanied by deep meaningful choices and spiritually enlightening soundscapes and music, I highly recommend any fan of the World of Darkness brand to grab this off of Steam or GOG.com. You would be barking mad not to. <laughs> Now then, for those who are new to the Law by Night brand and the reviews I occasionally do, I do not do out of 10 scores because they are subjectively pointless. One person's 10 out of 10 is another's 3 out of 5 stars, which is another's minus 42 out of 100. So I shall rate this game various unpronounceable Polish places and words out of 10, as that is just as helpful as a proper out of 10 score. To be kept updated, Follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we will upload each episode. 
You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.